Hello there, it's Lisa Starr with another episode of StarCast. And I have a super interesting guest today because her journey has been very unique from spa operations over into the big world of global branding and cosmetics and mass market sales. And she has a wealth of experience to share with us. So I'd like to introduce Suzanne Pengali, who starting very soon will be the general manager for North America of Elemis, a brand all of us in the spa industry are very familiar with. So thank you, Suzanne, for joining us today. Thank you so much. What a pleasure it is to be with you. Thank you. So Suzanne and I met, oh, we don't want to say how many years ago. <laughs> um, and she was working in a spa in New Jersey, but we're going to backtrack from there and ask Suzanne about, you know, where did your journey begin as all people do when you're a young girl? Did you dream of working in spas? So, uh, you know, it's interesting. I never dreamt of working in spas, but uh, I naturally migrated there. So I started in the industry, you know, of course it's been over, I guess, 20, 25 years. And I started working at a spa in Princeton, New Jersey, and it helped to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, after just a few weeks of being there, I felt at home. And so it was easy for me to excel from the front desk manager into, mm -hmm. um, or excuse me, fresh, front desk check-in person to front desk manager mm -hmm. to spa manager because I loved everything about it. Uh, so originally, of course, it was to help me to pay my bills. You had graduated uh, university at this point? Not yet. Not oh. yet. I mm -hmm. was, uh, it was really from the, you know, from when I started college until when I ended college. And uh, what a gift it was for me really? to be able to learn about the industry, learn about products, learn, of course, you know, what was working, what wasn't, how we could become more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a business course in itself. And so uh, that's really when I began and when my love affair started with product and with the industry and how far it could go in terms of wellness. Well, that's so great. And, you know, we often stumble upon something, right? So you have this position to help pay your bills as you go through college and you end up saying, well, I actually really like this. You know, they're really, it's so true. There was a, a point even during that time that I had considered stop go, to stop going to school and to mm -hmm. get my aesthetics license mm. because I loved it so much. And I really felt, uh, like I said before, at home mm -hmm. uh, with skincare and with the, the business. Of course, I, I chose not to do that. I'm uh, sure your parents were happy that you finished your <laughs> university. <laughs> my mother was quite clear. Let's mm -hmm. finish school. <laughs> and then if you want to do that as, a, as something else as well, of course, she was fully encouraged. She just wanted me to, to love what I do. Of course, that's what any of us wants. So when you did finish school, what was the logical next step for you? So uh, the logical next step, I knew I wanted to be in New York City. And uh, so I, st I took a job uh, in uh, technolo te technical recruiting, really, it was. Mm -hmm. So I was a headhunter for uh, big banks and, uh, and then also for um, startup technology companies. And while it didn't come as easy to me, mm -hmm. uh, it was such a gift to learn at that time the technology that would drive um, businesses and startups. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's the first time I had ever read a Wall Street Journal. Mm. You, you know, I had to learn, you know, who... I, the I language of business. I didn't even know who the banks were. I didn't know that Goldman Sachs was a big deal mm -hmm. or JP Morgan. So I was naturally just talking to a lot of these people off of mm. a script. And so anyway... Um, I did that uh, and I loved it and I did pretty well, uh, candidly. And um, unfortunately, 9-11 happened. Mm. And so the world, you know, of course, changed, changed, changed especially changed. for those banks, especially for those banks, certainly for the startups. Uh, and for me, it was a real pivotal moment because I, I did feel impacted, uh, much like so many others. And I said to myself, where do I feel most at home? And so mm -hmm. I went back to the spa industry mm -hmm. because it brought me comfort. It grounded me. I knew that the people around me, of course, I always got along because we were all talking a similar language mm -hmm. and having a lot of fun. And so I did migrate back to the world of spa and it was, um, you know, spa management. Mm -hmm. So how long did you stay in that role, Suzanne? 
Oh, that was a few years. So it must have been about uh, three or four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of my project was uh, with um, it was working with Robert Wood Johnson Wellness Center, as, mm -hmm. as you remember. And what one of the things was that I had to open up a retail store mm -hmm. that that really complemented the spa. And so I, I took my time to choose the right brands that would come in from a lifestyle perspective. And one of the brands or two of the brands were Jean Jacobs Spa Collection mm -hmm. and Peter Thomas Roth. Mm -hmm. And after developing a rapport uh, with the brand, they invited me and asked me to come work for them in New York. And I thought, well, oh. I, I guess I can come back. And I, I knew the products intimately. Mm -hmm. I had done my research. I, and I was really in, enthusiastic about transitioning back onto the, or excuse me, at first, at first to the brand side and to learn what it took. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I started out there as really in customer service. It was customer development and then business development. I, I developed, fortunately, it was great timing. Mm -hmm. I was able to develop their spa business because that's what I knew. It was developing protocols, working with the estheticians, working with um, day spas and mm -hmm. talking to them about how they can maximize their retail. Mm -hmm. And it, it all came so naturally to me because one, I had an eagerness to listen to mm -hmm. the people and uh, two, because I came from it. So I understood right. like, okay, well, this is a challenge when you're looking at your, you know, your nightly sales, or this is how you should incentivize your employees. So, uh, so I did that. And then, um, well, it's well, perfect that I can see why they went after you. I mean, having someone that understands the brand, but understands the, the market you're selling into, it's very difficult for people who are trying to sell into any market when they don't know the challenges those businesses face. But you obviously had firsthand experience in that. Yeah. And I, you know, I think they were a little bit ahead of their time because what we're seeing now, even in uh, the world, my world is that you're seeing companies like Madison Reed, of course, it's a mm -hmm. hair care brand. I mean, they're bringing in hairstylists to, to sell their product. You, you see a lot of skincare brands that really um, want to make sure that there are aesthetics, aesthetic licenses coming mm -hmm. in because they can speak to a knowledge and uh, that, that most people cannot. And the learning curve can be steep for some. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I do think that, that uh, Peter and June were a little bit ahead of their time in bringing me in because mm -hmm. not everybody was doing it back then. Now you see it more and more. And yes. I would say it's very, very effective. So you spent how much time working with those spa brands? I was working with uh, Peter and with June for about seven, I guess about seven years. Mm -hmm. And part of that journey was they had introduced, we were introduced to QVC mm. and which was <clears throat> almost the antithesis of spa, right? Yes. Because it was like, well, we've just built this whole spa world. Why would we ever go on QVC? But what we found uh, after I, I, I listened to Peter because I didn't want to do it, truth be told. Um, we went on and what we saw was that it created a platform mm -hmm. and it really helped to create a halo even for the spa brands because it was brand um, awareness and exposure. And so for, from that, I spent a lot of time on the, the business development, but mainly on QVC, mm -hmm. where it was more storytelling, content development, all about the ingredients. So again, very natural to me. And, um, and so after about, I guess, over seven years there, I was recruited by Cody, who had just acquired Philosophy, who was another direct to consumer mm -hmm. brand. And, um, and so I spent some time there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Cody, I mean, that's your first jump into a big, really global company, though. Yes, exactly. And, and, Cody, it was an interesting time to go. I mean, I knew that it would, A, it would help to develop my uh, knowledge base on, on television shopping because it was like getting my PhD at QVC. In for many sure. Years. And, you know, for listeners at that time, QVC was a force. I mean, people, I wasn't one, but people were watching it and buying amazing sales were created because it was really before e-commerce was so big, especially in the makeup and cosmetic space. It's true. I mean, at that time, it was, uh, you know, only a, you know, a few hundred million, and it went to well over a billion. 
<clears throat> just over the course of a few years and heritage brands and very strong ingredient based brands such as Bare Minerals, mm -hmm. Philosophy, mm -hmm. um, you know, Paracone. I, these were some of the brands that helped to build Peter, of course, uh, build their portfolio. So you spent some time at Cody learning. What did what was the difference there about that sort of more mass approach? Did, was did you learn anything specific? Oh sure, my goodness, I learn every day, and I learned a lot in that role. Um, one, it was transitioning. Um, I had to transition the business from uh, Arizona to New York, and mm. so the sheer um, workload in terms of creating process and operations. Again, when I think about wasn't that different, just on a different scale mm -hmm. uh, than what I did learn in the spa, because it was identifying the pain points, looking what was working, making sure that we're maximizing that or, or, or pushing that. And so I had to bring a lot of the knowledge transfer from Phoenix to New York, build an entirely new team. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was for the business that I was running, of course, was about 70% of their business across all of direct to consumer. So it was important that it worked. So I needed, yes. I needed the, I needed the management to be on board with my ideas and, and to help coach me because I had never been through such a massive integration and transition from a founder led brand into a big business. That sounds like great training though, like grad school, right? right? It was so much fun. And uh, of course I, the teams were incredible and I was able to, to build and, and learn every day. Like I said before, it was really mm -hmm. a gift. So what led you to your next role at that point? Uh, well, some of the management left and decided mm -hmm. to make a move. And, uh, and I was really like the direct to consumer queen, mm -hmm. right? In, in After your QVC that. experience, for sure. Yeah, it was e-com. If you have questions about e-com, if you have questions about, you know, what we call owned businesses, so our own retail space or own website, or a relationship that's more of a storytelling uh, and now pair that with integrating a brand from one location to the next, uh, you know, it, it, it's really why they brought me on or to Shiseido because mm -hmm. they were leaving and they needed to do the same thing for Bare Minerals. Mm -hmm. And Shiseido had acquired Bare Minerals for um, quite a bit of money and they needed it to succeed. So they transitioned, we had to transition the business from San Francisco to New York mm -hmm. and try to find as much efficiencies uh, as possible. So, you know, that, that, and on top of it, it was learning every other retail business. So now I suddenly had to understand wholesale. So the relationships mm. with Sephora, with Ulta, with, mm, you know, even the right. military bases. And if I'm honest with you, I was incredibly overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I thought, what have I done? This is crazy, mm -hmm. but it allowed me to learn every single re point of distribution as it pertains to retail and which was exactly why I took the role because mm -hmm. I didn't want to be known. I wanted to diversify. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So now you have the direct to consumer retail, the direct to consumer service from the spa and, and now these other points of, of commerce. So you have a very deep understanding now, Suzanne, of how to sell cosmetics and skincare in yeah. all these different venues. But let me tell you, Lisa, I just have to say the thing that taught me the most about um, retail distribution and what sells product mm -hmm. by listening to the people that actually sell the product. Mm -hmm. They are true, truly the voice of the customer. And uh, so I learned so much from the estheticians. I learned so much from the people in the stores. I would just go on, on, um, field tours mm -hmm. and meet with people. And I would develop, you know, it was our library of sound bites of what resonated with the consumer and mm -hmm. what didn't. To have that level of transparency with product and authenticity with product that really so few other brands really had. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was because of the people. And I, I am a firm believer that if you go to your sales force or if you go to the people that are using the product the most, they can uh, unleash a level of understanding and what's resonating with the consumer more so than any marketing department or any study. <laughs> well, well, good for you because here you are in your office in the ivory tower in New York, but you, and you have a marketing department, but you're venturing out and asking, as you said, the end user, and that's sort of that ground level research that really pays off. 
For sure, for sure. That and, and reading reviews, you know, it's understanding the customer sentiment that that's mm-hmm. always been, I, I used to do before they had um, technology to actually source the information and the sentiment. I used to develop word clouds and show mm-hmm. the, the organization, this is what she's saying about our product. Mm-hmm. What are we going to do about that? You know, the good, the bad, um, and the indifferent. So, uh, so I'm a firm believer, I could not stress it more that the, the customer will tell you and you have to really, really listen to her. So Bear um, is a clean, you know, pride themselves on that, sustainable, like moving forward brand. Um, so, and you were, it was the right time for that, especially the last four or five years. Could you talk a little bit about that, that growth in the company and how you managed to focus on those elements? Absolutely. You know, Bear was ahead of its time. It had started creating clean formulas uh, and they were never overt about it. So they were Mm -hmm. never taking credit for what they actually had done. And it was one of the one of the brands that really um, pioneered clean beauty. Mm -hmm. And so now we, you know, talking about what clean is in in the industry, it's almost, you know, a a given that you have to be clean going forward. Mm -hmm. It's just, it is, it's, it is what it is. And if you're not, then you need to have the transparency or the understanding You have to tell the consumer, why am I not? Mm -hmm. So it, where it used to be something that you can highlight as a point of differentiation, it's really no longer going to be that way because the beauty industry has evolved. You see it with uh, retailers that are getting behind clean beauty in a more meaningful manner, mm-hmm. like Sephora, like the Ultas of the world, even like QVC. Oh, and now we have mm-hmm. Credo in those places that only sell clean, correct? That's exactly right. And and I, you know, I do think that there's such a market for it, and people are willing to spend more because, especially after you're getting treatments and you know, why do all of this, <clears throat> pardon me, to put chemicals on your skin that you're not sure about, right? You know, because if you do the research, you'll see some will say that it's, it's okay. Others will say it's not. And really, if I come, do from you want to take that risk? Why would you take that risk when you don't have to, we don't have to wear poisonous lipstick. Exactly. Exactly. When you think of how many times you're lifting your lips, lips, uh-huh. <laughs> just go to the way that you operate. Right. So so you really focused on having Bear really trumpet their story a bit more because as you say, it had always been clean and it just wasn't a thing that they made a lot of noise about. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing that, that's complicated it or, or that was a challenge certainly for Bear and I think for many other brands is that there's really no definition of clean. Mm-hmm. The industry is still trying to figure that out. Mm-hmm. You know, what is certified clean? I mean, there are some obvious ingredients that are you know like not having parabens exactly Mm -hmm. but when you get down to a certain level there's like in terms of the types of paraffins that are used the way that it's sourced I mean suddenly it becomes very very difficult you know to really understand okay well Sephora is clean is different than um QVC is clean is Mm. different than Credo is clean is different than you know suddenly it's they all vary a little bit and Mm. so that That was a real complication because as a brand, you had to merge all of the requirements and also what we thought was going to happen in the future and just make sure that you ticked off every single box because Mm -hmm. it changes, I mean, truly on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. That's a great point. I mean, clean is not a thing we can look up and the FDA has said you have to be this or that the way they have with organics. So Um, But consumers know they want it. That much we know. Consumers know they want it. They want clean beauty. So what do you see, Suzanne, in your next role as will be a challenge as you transition into Elemis? Um, Well, at first I'll say that it was really a very natural decision for me. I mean, I, I, of course, I was very sad to leave my role because of the people and um, the, the management was incredible. And really, I had been around the management team for so many years. But what I would say is, when I first had the discussion and the interview process with Elemis, it was going back home again, mm. because there was such, um, they started in the spa. I can remember years mm-hmm. ago, I was in, in Dubai, and I saw the brand Elemis. It was the first time I was I was introduced mm. to the brand. And of course, it was in the spa. And so um, I think what I'm most excited about, Lisa, uh, in terms of going there is to 
getting back into product, really mainly focusing on skincare, um, you know, seeing how we can evolve an already incredible, incredible brand um, from, uh, you know, certainly a clean perspective, and then also to a sustainability, sustainability perspective. Mm -hmm. Because again, like I said before, it's table stakes now. You know, you have mm -hmm. to be, and, and the consumer is okay if you don't have everything perfect, but as long as you're transparent about that mm -hmm. and have an end date in mind, they, they get it. So Elemis products run the gamut from face to body. I mean, they're very well known, you know, on cruise ships and in other countries, I think maybe a little less well known in North America, but Suzanne will take care of that. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers so, crossed. So, um. What do you think the consumer response to COVID in retail, like how do you see that panning out as 2021 evolves? So it's been interesting to watch, right? In the beginning, I think everybody was a little bit shell-shocked. They mm -hmm. didn't know what to do. Uh, certainly, I think the brands that pivoted immediately to digital, recognizing that brick and mortar would be impacted or that the brands that, that seemed to thrive, um, you would have had to had some sort of integration process already on the way or done in order to do mm -hmm. that. So we did see you know, a handful of the brands that were savvy in terms of pivoting mostly to digital and story telling um, survive and do quite well you know they weren't as impacted um, I think the consumer you know when you think about the way that she's been shopping and what she's been going through in her personal life you know I love and I could say for myself that people had a minute to reset right mm -hmm. some of the with family values with the idea of building relationships, you know, um, this idea of inner beauty and outer beauty suddenly like really it, it, it came up strong. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, for many people in the wellness world, it's like what we believe in, but the, the um, average consumer wasn't doing both internal and external. Mm -hmm. And so what I've really loved to watch and to see is this idea of self-care within the home, cooking differently, taking mm -hmm. different supplements. You know, so, so all of these ingestibles, it's finally, it's going to have a moment, right? Um, right. Uh, same thing with body care, taking baths. You know, I, I know that even for myself, I have been taking so many baths. I've been soaking so much. Mm -hmm. um, my kids soak. They are, mom, you know, what product can I put That's on? I mean, it's, it's fantastic. And I, and I, you know, I caught I, just funny story. I caught my son meditating the other day and I just started laughing. I was like, that's I so great. Kid. But I do think that the, um, we've all had the ability to think of wellness in a new way. And mm -hmm. it's, it's been critical, I think for people's state of mind. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I'm enthusiastic, of course, of the acceleration of digital and also the acceleration of wellness uh, and, and well-being beauty, uh, it's not going to go away. No. It, it's just not because people see they've been able to reap the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they understand that, you know, whether it be um, that bath that you're taking mm -hmm. or, you know, as you're, I, I know even for myself, I take a product and I smell it and then I just relax. I mm -hmm. really try to be mindful and present. And um, every study that we see, uh, it, we recognize that, people are valuing that in a more meaningful way. Well, I loved your point about the pause button, which we we needed. We didn't realize we needed it, but we did. And we all had to stop what we were doing. And, it, you know, I think the fact that it was global to me was key because I remember, you know, in April saying, I just want to go to a country where this isn't happening, but there isn't one, you right. know, so we're all in it and we all had to to accept our new reality and make the best of it. And people did start to pay attention to their eating, their mindfulness, their body movement, their self-care, as you said. And there was a concern, I'll say later in the spring, you know, May, uh, as we started to see a horizon for spas to reopen, we were worried that consumers would come back, you know, will they be afraid of being touched? Or is Absolutely. this the end? And, you know, so we were all sort of biting our, our nails. And, uh, you know, what we've seen has been so encouraging. And all of the spas that I work with, or that I, you know, interact with, I mean, are super busy. And, as busy as they can be, even if they have capacity restrictions. So what that says to me is the consumer 
who understands that they, yes, they are in charge of their wellness, but they do seek that high touch experience that the spa offers. Absolutely. I, you know, and, and that's what I, I think there's also a level of authority that they're looking for, you know, tell me what to do. I mm -hmm. trust you now. Um, it, it, they're, they're seeing the benefits of them doing it at home. And so it will be amplified, of course, as you go into the spa and work with uh, such a skilled individual. Mm -hmm. uh, I think just as simple as the lack of touch, mm -hmm. you know, has really deprived us, us of something that is, is natural. I mean, I, I know even for myself, just the inability to be able to hug Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my extended family during the time, it was really difficult for me because I'm a hugger. Right. And yeah, we're spa uh, people. We hug. I mean, yeah. We hug. We hug. So I do think that um, it, it is very encouraging to see that people again, you know, see the benefits of the, um, uh, of the high touch experience, as you mm -hmm. said. Well, it's, it's very true that we do crave that. I mean, and we've known for centuries that humans crave human touch, but now we got the evidence of it because we all felt we really missed it. And so many of us have said, oh, I just can't wait till I can, as you said, hug people again and be, you know, I went to the Global Wellness Summit in November and it was the first conference I'd been to, obviously. Something that usually has 600 people and it had 100 and we sat six feet apart, but we were so thrilled to just be in the same room with each other. So it does bode well. I feel like our industry is going to really have a great lift from this, both from retail and the service perspective. And um, we'll see the role that Elemis plays in it. I'm yeah. looking forward to that. You know, it's, it's um, me too. Yes. Uh, but what I would say, I think the other thing that's kind of interesting with spa services specific to skincare, uh, I think people have uh, gotten comfortable with, you know, it's like what, what I would call makeup optional skin, mm -hmm. uh, where you mm. don't necessarily have to wear as much makeup. Now, don't get me wrong. I do think there's going to be a real color moment when mm -hmm. people take off the masks, they're mm -hmm. going to want to actually express themselves. But I do think that for skincare in particular, people are taking better care of their skin. They're seeing once again, the benefits and they're a little bit more comfortable with not wearing as much. And mm -hmm. I think that's been really, I mean, they talk about inclusivity and diversity and all of that. I mean, people just being comfortable with their age and with their skin uh, is I think another really positive thing that's come out of this. Totally agree. And that's a great observation. Um, we have all let our hair down, so to speak. <laughs> And of seen each other on Zoom and you've seen people's dogs and kids in the background and, and sort of a little bit of the artifice just kind of melted away and we've become more ourselves, which is, I'm sure, a good thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I wish you the best of luck at Elemis. Can't wait to see what you do. Suzanne Pengali, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate it.